بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليم كثيرا أما بعض As has been announced we're dealing with this issue that in actuality has been dealt with as every issue has in the religion the etiquettes of how people are supposed to get along as it relates to ikhtilaf the Quran and the authentic sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, is replete with many of the ayat and the ahadith that clearly show and indicate and prove the importance of this issue is something that's natural. Scholars of Islam and all of the books of hadith, fiqh, mention the etiquette of ikhtilaf. So we have to avoid two extremes. One extreme is the people who say that as it relates to this issue of ikhtilaf, all ikhtilaf is good, so there's no problem. So there's no need for refutations as a result of that. So they don't believe in refutations. And that's not acceptable because the Quran, as I mentioned, too many examples of people having discussions, discourse, arguments, debates in the Quran, in the Sunnah, and they were refuted. So it's from our religion. From that, there's a story with Ibrahim and the king doing his time, arguing back and forth. King was arguing for Baltin, Ibrahim was arguing for the Hat. And he said to the man, Allah brings the sun up from the east and causes it to set in the west, you do the opposite. He wasn't able to do it, so Allah mentioned in the Quran, Fabuhi to Levi Kafir. So the one who was a disbeliever, arguing based upon falsehood, he was dumbfounded, defeated in the argument. Ibrahim made a rad on that particular man with what was needed in the discussion. The Prophet ﷺ, throughout his da'wah, he refuted people in discussing with them, sometimes nicely and sometimes it led to serious issues, like the Mubahala in Surah Ali Imran. He was giving da'wah to the Christians of Najran, calling them to Allah, explaining them to them that Isa is not the son of Allah, but he's like Adam, Salawatullahi wa salam alayhima and they continued to argue with him back and forth. Prophet Sallallahu was informed to say to those people, bring your kids, we bring our children, bring your women, we'll bring our women, and then let us invoke the curse of Allah upon the one who was lying. And that's because they were going back and forth, and the Prophet used that serious issue. It's called the Mubahala. Disagreeing with someone, they don't accept your proof, you don't accept their proof, it's a serious issue. You want to refute the bottle, one of the two people calls you to a mubahala. That's the extreme case of showing in Al Islam when it comes to refutations, they can be hard. And that's why we have some of the salaf of this ummah making serious and harsh refutations on people. But you can't just look at that and think that you refute everybody in a hard and a harsh manner. Is this the discussion like Ibrahim and the person who was with him, Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, and also over here as we have the extreme with the mubahala and asking Allah to curse the people who are lying, severe. So the issue today, Ikhwani, is towards that discussion of the people who refute, but they go overboard in refuting. So one extreme, no refutations, ikhtilaf is okay, let everything just flow how it is. The other extreme is the one who wants to refute everything and everybody, and he wants to refute in any way. His refutation is in any way. It's the people who go overboard in refutations. 
And as we mentioned many times, and it should be understood, going to extremes in any aspect of the deen or the dunya is not acceptable in al-Islam. قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابَ لَا تَغْلُوا فِي دِينِكُمْ وَلَا تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْحَقِّ Tell the people, the Christians, أَهْلُ الْكِتَابَ يَهُودًا النَّصَارَى Don't have ghulu in your religion. Nothing Islam is asking you to do too much of anything. No ibadah or anything. Everything is moderate. So the people go overboard in the issues of refuting people. In this deen of Allah, the Prophet used to want good for the people. He wanted people to be guided. So in refuting, the refutation was comparable to what was needed by the one who's been having a discussion. It's not just always hard. It's not just always rough. So I want to share with you some of those etiquettes. And as I mentioned, the Quran is replete with these other ahkam and etiquettes. There are many. When we have ikhtilaf, we refer back to Allah's book and back to the sunnah. So many issues. But we have to address the issue of the people go overboard in refuting. First thing that has to be considered from the etiquettes, obviously, is al-ikhlas. If a person is sincere in what he is doing, then the method that he uses is going to be indicative of his ikhlas. The method that he's going to be using. Because the one who has ikhlas, he wants, as I mentioned, the guidance of the one who is disagreeing with him. The one that they don't see eye to eye. He wants them to know the truth. So he has to have ikhlas. And we know in our deen, ikhlas is the cornerstone of every ibadah from the ibadat of al-Islam. No ikhlas, the thing is lost. So as it relates to dawah in this religion, all of those ayahs of the Quran that command us to give dawah, none of them tell us to give dawah to ourselves, to our imam, to our madhat, to our jama'ah, or to our opinion. Qul sabili ad'u Tell them, Muhammad, this is my way. I give dawah to Allah. Not to my madhat, not to my jama'ah, not to my qabila other than that. He mentioned in the Quran, Women Ahsan Kodimiman Da illahi. Who is better in his speech than the one who's giving dawah to Allah? Not my jama'at, all of that, all of that. So all of those ayat, wajadil hum bilatihi ahsan, all of those ayats, Allah Ta'ala has commanded the people to call people to his religion to himself. So if a person has ikhlas and he's calling to Allah with ikhlas and his reputation is with that. It's going to solve a lot of the problems. When a person doesn't have ikhlas and he wants to refute the person he's refuting, that person who he's refuting made a mistake because of lack of ikhlas. Someone that he likes made the same mistake and he won't give the same ruling or the same refutation. Ikhlas is important, it's pinnacle. If a person were to say something negative about one of the four imams and it's not really negative, for an example, one of the imams, they may rule or judge, has been judged that he's considered to be weak in hadith. If he were to hear a normal person say that, he'd get upset. But the scholars who said it before, he won't get upset. So ikhlas ikhwani prevents from contradictions. It prevents from blindness. A person who gives a rad or a refutation for himself, for his jama'ah, the way he's going to give the refutation, if there's no ikhlas, it's going to be a problem. Second, from the important etiquettes, is the issue of knowledge and knowing what you're doing. It's possible that an individual is refuting something that should not be refuted. It is a position that doesn't warrant all of the commotion that's been created. If a person doesn't have knowledge, he will make the mistake of passing judgment of takfir on someone because he doesn't understand the issue, and he's refuting based upon ignorance. So when it comes to the issue of refutation, and we still continue to advise, Allah didn't make it our responsibility to refute anyone. The people in this room, it's not our job to refute. That's not our job. Our job is to learn the religion and to practice al-Islam to the best of our abilities and to help to guide the people around us. We have to get knowledge about our religion and the people who are around us. As for making it our responsibilities, every Amr, Bakr, Zaid here thinks it's his job. 
hadith said min husni islam and mar tarquhu ma la yani from a person's good islam the fact that he is a good muslim is he leaves alone that which doesn't concern him it's not our concern to refute isis that's not our concern allah didn't make that our responsibility that's the responsibility of people who have knowledge and the ability to do that and although you may be on the correct side of the fence concerning the issue that's one thing refuting is another thing so knowledge ikhwani, is imperative in the fiqh of al-islam the scholars came up with a statement that is reality and they said al-hukmu al shaykh in order to give a ruling about something, you have to have the correct concept of what that something, what that thing happens to be. So when a person is not endowed with knowledge, he'll think something is one way, and he thinks that it is ma'roof, when in fact it is munkar, it's the opposite of that. And the other person is on the right side. So with knowledge, he'll know about the etiquettes, and he'll know about how to use the delil, how to deal with the delil of the person on the other side. What is the level of the ikhtilaf between the two people? What's the level? Because all of that will determine the methodology. Number three, and as I mentioned, Ikhwani, there are many, is the issue of justice. When it comes to refuting in Al-Islam, we have to be just. So Allah Azza wa Jal, in many ayat of the Quran, he revealed those ayat speaking to the mentality of Quraysh who used to have a lot of contradictions. So there was a discussion, a hiwar, the way of arguing and convincing people with the way of truths of what they're doing, the reality that's around them. So the kuffar of Quraysh used to bury their daughters alive because in their opinion, the female species was lower despised, underfoot, degraded. But Allah Ta'ala asks them, or put the question to their minds, if this is the case, then why do you attribute to Allah, why do you attribute to him daughters? Because you say that the angels, the angels, they are the daughters of Allah. So why, why do you do that? So that's a contradiction. You don't want daughters connected to yourselves, but you will connect daughters to the one who created you. And you believe in him. And you believe that he is Allah. That's a way to appeal to the mind, to the intellect of the individual. You have to be fair and just. You can't be a person who is not just. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah described the people of the Sunnah in many statements that we made over and over again. In the field of refutation, he said that the people of the Sunnah, they refute people with knowledge and justice. They don't refute people with what is unjust. What is an injustice? When you make things up about what the person is saying. So as a result of that, you made it up and you're lying about what happened. And the discussion is about that and you know it's a lie. And we'll lie here that happens. People attribute to other people what they didn't do and what they didn't say. We mentioned to you when the people wanted to bring down an Imam Bukhari. He proved himself to the creation. People have intellect. Anyone who came across the man, they could see this is an ayah from the ayat of Allah. But when the people who were against him, ikhtilaf between him and them, when that happened, those people said he was giving crazy fatwas. Fatwas that were erroneous. Anyone who were to hear it would say it's impossible for him to say that. But when that was made up about him, it created drama, drama. And people were refuting each other in that way. Not telling the truth is a problem. So if I want to refute someone, and as I refute them, I'm unjust. I'm an in, serving an injustice in the refutation. That's a sign and an indication of Khwani again goes back to the original issue. Lack of ikhlas. The truth can stand by itself. If you have to revert to lying in anything other than when lying is permissible, if you have to revert to lying in anything, then know that, again, the truth is not with you. It's as simple as that. When it comes to the realm of knowledge, when you deal with people, don't be of the people who lie to get your point across. Don't attribute a statement to a scholar that's not true, especially to the Prophet Don't make up things 
Ibn Utaymiya said this, and you make up something to prove your point. Refutation, it requires justice. And from the justice, the ruling you give him, you have to give him. That's from the justice. And when people go overboard, refute, they don't do that. They don't give all signs a fair shake. Next, we come to the issue of refuting and the person is at that stage of being able to refute that you're the man for the job. And this is critical as well. Right now with the social media, any and everyone can become an individual who can talk about the religion. And that's nothing, that's a problem or to complain about if that's used correctly. Because everyone who knows the truth, he has a responsibility to spread that truth within his own ability. As I mentioned, those people around us know what you're doing and just do what you have the ability to do. But anyone can comment and anyone can put and initiate any, anything on the internet, anything, true, false, or in between that. When a person is not prepared and is not ready, is not the man for the job, he's not experienced enough, it's going to create more problems than it's going to bring about benefit, even if there is some benefit that's connected to it. For that reason, the Quran, the Sunnah, the way of the Salaf is that young people should relax until they get to a stage where other people have preceded them, endorsed them, and say, yep, you're okay now. You're ready for the issue. Now we know during the time of an Imam Malik and people like that, an Imam Malik said, I didn't start talking. I didn't start giving lessons until so many of the ulama of Medina, and he gave some astronomical number to indicate how tough it was back there, back then, to just put yourself in the arena of addressing the community and the minds of the Muslims. That was back then. Things were pretty tight. Things were under control for the most part. Now, every Amr, Bakr, and Zaid, he has the ability to say and do what he wants to say and do. So he wants to start to refute. He wants to refute any and everybody. I show you the importance of Khwani of how the Salaf used to consider age and issues like this. And there are many examples, but during the time of the companions themselves, we know that a lot of drama, it transpired, especially during the Khilaf of Ali ibn Abi Talib. During the Khilaf of Ali, Aisha, some of the other virtuous companions were in opposition to Ali, and it led to the Battle of Safin. <coughs> When Aisha was galvanizing and getting support from the people of Kufa, pay attention. She's getting the people of Kufa in this masjid to support her, to tell them, Uthman has been killed, I'm your mother, I'm from the ulama, and she wanted to get the support of the masjid right here in Kufa. Ali ibn Abi Talib knew that they were going to try to get these people support, so he sent his son al Hassan and Ammar ibn Yasir. He sent them to Kufa. After I, Aisha talked to the people, they arrived. And Hassan got on the minbar on the first step. Ammar got on the second step. Ammar said to these people, I swear by Allah, I'm telling you, I know that this lady, Aisha, who was here, she is his wife in the dunya and the akhirah. Radi Allahu anha. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, but Allah is testing you people with her. Allah wants to see if you people are going to listen to him or you're going to listen to her. Listen to Allah means you have to follow Ali ibn Abi Talib because we're here speaking on his behalf. And why did he send his son Hassan? And why did he send Ammar? He sent Hassan to show these people just as Aisha was his wife. Aisha is his wife. Here is his grandson and you people know him just as well. And his grandson is from my virtues. But with him is Ammar. And Ammar was on the second step. And Ammar spoke. Why didn't Hassan speak? And he was old enough to speak. And he was eloquent enough to speak. Ammar spoke because Ammar, he was born in the same year that the Prophet was born, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the year of the elephant, in the same year. By this time, he's almost 70 years old. He's in his mid-60s at this fitna of Safin. 
Now, if Hassan were to speak, Hassan is not the man for the job right now with this big fitna. The person for the job is the man who is older, held in great esteem in the minds of the community. A young brother he wants to come and he wants to refute someone who's big in El Islam. And the young brother has the truth with him as well. And the one who's big in Islam, he made a mistake and he deserves to be refuted. And that thing he did deserves to be explained. But who's going to listen to the young brother? Who's going to listen to him? He's not the man for the job. And not only that, when he does that, he's going to create problems. He's going to make people look at him and say, what are you talking about? Have you lost your mind? And if there are a number of people who are like that on that thing, it creates a balbala, creates a little problem in the community because the community starts to say, these people think that they're actually, they've reached the level of mujtahideen. Everyone is a mujtahid in his religion. So you have to be the man for the job. You can't be just any person who came and you just started practicing Islam right now. They, they ask, al-albani, in the last part of his life, when the drama of the ikhtilaf of the Salafis, that is what we see today, the hot mess that's here right now. They said, what's your opinion about the situation? He said, I see it as a direct result of young people giving fatawas and young people getting involved in refuting and young people taking position and responsibility that was left in the past for the people who were more qualified, more capable, more able. So no doubt, Khwani, that is one of the important aspects and etiquettes of the issue of refuting people, that refutation is not for everyone. As I said to you, from a person's good Islam, is him minding his own business and dealing with his own affairs. And if we come to the Q&A session, inshallah, and someone out there feels, okay, I'm in a real situation right now where I should be refuting someone. I want you to disprove me, to disprove me. I'm not challenging anybody here. I'm telling you what I believe that I know is the truth. No one here, no one, and Allah knows best, has been instructed by Allah Azza wa Jal to refute Daesh, to refute people who are making big mistakes. No one, it's not our job. But we all have been commanded, everybody here, without an exception, Everybody has been commanded to learn your religion so that you can practice your religion. You and the people around you. Am I saying if I'm on the internet or I meet someone who is on a way that is astray, that I can't give him doubt Allah? I'm not saying that. I know an individual who he believes in something that's not true and he's from my relatives and he doesn't take the hadith and he's just on the Quran. Are you telling me that I can't advise him and give him dawa? No, I'm telling you, you learn the religion for yourself and the people around you, including your relative, who that's his situation. I'm talking about refuting people. I'm going to refute this sect and that sect and this person and that person and this one from a long time ago or right now. It's not our job. It's not my job to refute the rafida. That's not my job. It's not my job. I have relatives like that. I give them dawa about their reality. It's not my job. So when the person, again, is young and he thinks that this is responsibility, creates a number of problems. Number one is the issue of ajab, benefs, person is impressed with himself. How can you think that this is your job? Any one of us. How can you think that? The truth about those people or that individual, that group, the truth that you know is true. You're on the haq on that. We're not talking about that. Why do you think it's your job to do it? Leave it to somebody who's uh, more competent, more qualified, more experienced, more knowledgeable. And save yourself the responsibility. Also, the young person who's not qualified, one of the things it points to and it shows is that uh, there are going to be some mistakes. Because the younger you are, the younger you are, these types of issues require what you don't have, and that's experience, to put, what, to put with whatever knowledge you do have. Am I saying that the young man doesn't have a role in the truth can't be with him, like it was, was with Abdullah bin Abbas when he used to sit with Umar and those ulama from the companions? I'm not saying that. The 
Prophet Sallallahu sent Musab ibn Umair, young man, to Al Medina to give Dawah Allah. I'm not saying a young person can't give a Dawah Allah. I'm not saying a young person can't give Dawah to what he knows and teaches what he knows. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about refuting people. The young person refuting someone who, we don't agree with that individual, but he has a place in the society. As a result of that, your refutation may create a bigger problem than what you're trying to solve. And another issue, Ikhwani, the environment that we're living in. We're living in an environment right now where now Muslims are looking at us. So when I refute you and you refute me, they're studying that and they manipulate that situation and they keep the control on us even that much more. I'm not talking about other Muslims who don't agree with your way. A salafia. People don't agree with that way. So when they see these refutations, for an example, from any group of Muslims, any group of Muslims, I'm not talking about the Muslims that don't like that group. I'm talking about the non-Muslims looking at the Muslims and manipulating that situation. So, ikhwani at-ta'ahul, at-ta'ahul. They say in uh, al-fiqh, when it comes to al-mirath, al-mirath, when you get the money that you inherit, a man will inherit from his father. He can inherit from his father. But if he kills his father in order to get the inheritance, and that's found out, obviously he doesn't get the inheritance. So the scholars in this issue came up with a principle, and it is a universal principle that we have to remember because it's the sunnah of Allah. Okay, again, it's about al-mirath. Someone you have the right to inherit from that individual. And you cause their death like these people do. They kill people and get the insurance policy. In Al-Islam, if you do that, you forfeit your right to inheritance. So the scholar said, Men Anyone who tried to speed up something that should not have been sped up, he tried to accelerate it. It wasn't the time for it. You speed it up, you're going to be punished by not being able to acquire what you're trying to get. You're in haste for something. And because of that haste, you're going to destroy the opportunity. So when the Muslims want to overthrow their governments, they have bad leaders, they have a lot of problems, but the Muslims are divided amongst themselves. The Muslims amongst themselves, the community, they have problems. They are just upset uh, from being oppressed. That's it. That's the uh, common denominator. They're all upset because they're being oppressed. So when they decide to overthrow the government, and in time for that, they're going to be punished by not being able to complete what they tried to do because it's not time for that. And the Prophet, he understood that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From day one in Mecca, he could have said, listen, I'm a man and I'm tough and I'm strong. I have Abu Bakr and I have my wife, a strong woman behind me, and I have a young man, Ali, and I have this slave over here, Zaid, right here. We have five people and Allah is with us. And after two or three days, he could have started to be an individual who wants to clash. But he knows this principle. It's a principle from the Quran and the Sunnah. Anyone who tries to speed up something, and it's not time for that, you'll be punished by not being able to acquire that particular thing. So striking the iron when it's hot is important, and not striking the iron when it's not the time is a problem as well. So we have to have a ta'ahul. You have to be a person who is the man for the job. So the last thing we want to mention about this point, and we have to connect it here with the reality of what we're dealing with, because we're not living in some bubble detached from reality. We may have moved from downstairs to a new place, but still it's the reality. One of the signs of the hour when the man came and said, Ya Rasulullah, when is the hour? And the prophet kept talking and he ignored the man. And the people said, the prophet heard what he said. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he didn't like that question, and that's why he kept talking. Other people said, no, we don't think he heard. So the man said it again, Ya Rasulullah, when is Yawm Al-Qiyamah? Prophet Muhammad kept talking, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the people said the same thing. Maybe he didn't like what he said. Maybe he didn't hear it. After everything was over, he got up to walk out. He said, where is the one who questioned me? The man said, here I am, Ya Rasulullah. He said, if the amana is lost, then you wait for the hour. If the amana, the trust, honesty, if it is lost, then know that the hour is close. It's, uh, it's upon you. And the amana means a lot of things. The amana is leave something to someone, would he take care of it? 
Allah left people the most important thing, the deen. Did they take care of it? So many, a man act. And also his honesty. The Bedouin went on to get further clarification, elucidation. Ya Rasulullah, how will honesty be lost? How will the imana be lost? How, how? He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِذَا وُسِّدَ الْأَمْرِ إِلَى غَيْرِ أَهْلِهِ if responsibility is given to other than the right people, if the responsibility is handed out and the wrong people got charge of the reins of whatever they're responsible for, like the one who just became the president of the United States of America, that's a clear example. So instead of like us getting all crazy and emotional about things that are going on around us, we have to look at what did our religion say about that issue? That issue tells us Yom Qiyam is very, very close. It's extremely close, extremely close. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the one who was not ready yet to be the refuter. And when he puts himself in that position, that's a sign of the hour. Social media is a sign of the hour. That anybody can get on there and give fatwas about serious things, about who's on it, who's off it, who's a Muslim, who's not a Muslim. What's jihad and what's this and what's that? Last one that we want to mention, Khwani, and this is really an important one and it's a technical one as well, that uh, people oppress other people and it has its origin in knowledge as well and in ikhlas. And that is refuting people and in the process of refuting them, you make them responsible for what is called the lawazim, the lawazim. The lawazim is when you refute an individual about a particular issue you force upon him your understanding, and that may not be the case, although he may be saying something that caused you to understand it that way. But usually because of your shidda, you're being like that. For an example, when you travel in al-Islam, you have to shorten your prayers. Not an option. You should shorten your prayer. Aisha said, may Allah be pleased with her. In the beginning of al-Islam, Salat al-Dhuhr, Salat al-Asr, Salat al-Isha, it was two rakah, and that was it. And then, as Islam went on, Salat al-Dhuhr, Salat al-Asr, Salat al-Isha was raised to four in Medina, and it stayed the same when we travel. So it's not an option. When you are stationary, you pray four rakah. And when you travel, you only pray two. The option is, do you pray two by itself, or do you pray two and combine? That's the only choice. So that's the correct position. Ulama al Islam say that it's wajib upon you to shorten your prayer when you travel because the Prophet never ever, not one time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a whole prayer while he traveled. You're debating with a person and disagreeing with a person who says, no, in my madhab, that is Hanafi, we travel and we pray the whole prayer except that Hajj is the only place where we shorten our prayer. So you say from the lawazim, you are rejecting the Quran and the Sunnah. So as a result of that, you are kafir. So you put your lawazim, your understanding on that person. He's not saying that. He's saying this is what we do in my madhab and this is all that I know. And although what you just said may be true, I'm not ready to check that out for whatever reason. But this is what I'm doing. This is my madhab. Don't put that man out of Islam for something like that. Muslims just voted. Muslims just voted. So you believe voting is not permissible and you're arguing back and forth with those clear ayat that show voting is not permissible. Clear ayat. And when he doesn't accept your point of view and your side of the story, you tell him that he loves to judge by other than what Allah reveals. And whoever does that, they are not Muslim. That's from the lawazim. So if you see an individual sitting with a group of people like the Shiite, his sitting with the Shiite is not something you can refute him for just because he was sitting with the Shiite. You can't refute him for that because that's an indication that he loves them. He smiled. So that's a case that he loves them. It's not true. That's not a, it could be a case. It may not be the case. But those lawazim, they are from the uh, indicators, from the barahin and the dalai that show a person not being fair. He's not being just. 
He's not having ikhlas. He's lying. Just, just tell the truth and stick to what you know. Tell the truth and make the refutation with the correct adab. And there are many other adab, ikhwani, many, many. But we wanted to mention those because these are the things that we're seeing. And uh, this issue of how to refute with etiquette, as I mentioned, it's been written about by many scholars. There's a recent scholar who lived during our time. He's been dead for a few years now. And the Sheikh Bakr, Bakr Abdullah Abu Zaid, the book about the fiqh of the Rad al makhalif He's not the only one. Scholars way before him. So if you want to learn more about the issue, the opportunity is there. And I'm sure on the internet as well, they are in Arabic and in English talks about how to give refutations. Okay, Khwani, we're going to stop here, take about five minutes of your questions, and then call it a day, inshallah. What time is it? Anybody got the time? Is it a clock up here? You guys have any questions? Tafadil, ya akhi. Hey, is there any water up here, man? Any? I think it's in the box. As for the people who say that uh, uh, we're not refuting, but we're just relaying the refutation of the sheikh and so forth and so on, that's, again, um, I wasn't there when the person said that or the people were saying this, so exactly what they're saying, I don't know, but it seems to be philosophical to me. I'm not really refuting, but I'm just passing the message of the sheikh who refuted him. And like with Ammar ibn Yasir, Ahmad ibn Yasir is liked by everybody. He's liked by the people of Shiite as well because he supported Ali radiallahu anhu and the haq that he was upon. But anyway, when Ahmad was killed in the battle of Safin as an old man, radiallahu anhu, Ali ibn Abi Talib wanted to prove to Muawiyah and his side, you people killed Ammar. And the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, told Ammar, taqtuluka, you're going to be killed, Ammar, by the oppressive group. So he was walking around knowing he was going to be a shaheed. And he knew that this fitna was going to be the end of his life even. Radiallahu anhu. So when Ali used that as an argument to get these people to pay attention, listen, you people are wrong. Aisha, you, you are wrong. Ammar was with me on my side. Muawiyah, he, he, he was with me on my side. Muawiyah radiallahu anhu said to Ali, he said, no, you killed him because you made him come out. We didn't kill him. You killed him, Ali, because you encouraged him to come out with you and because he came out with you, he supported you. So that was their way of not taking responsibility for what had happened. It's not the truth. No, he was with Ali's side and so forth and so on. And what you're saying here, like this person, when he says, I'm not refuting, it's my shaykh that's refuting, that's a bit philosophical, and Allah knows best. Any questions, Akhwani? Tafadiyah. You know the way you mentioned that, um, uh, to qualify that the younger person should come uh, forward and uh, refute somebody who has knowledge, like somebody who's famous or something. Um, what about if nobody who is qualified has come forward and uh, brought forward and clarified? Hold on, so I remember the first thing. Brothers asking and asking a really good question. What if uh, no one who is older, no one who's qualified, has actually come out to refute the person, the group, the idea, the issue that needs to be refuted? So the only one who's left is this individual. Is he blameworthy in this case? Usually at Khwani, if people are old, they didn't come out to deal with the situation, they're not coming out is the action that should be done. That's what happened with the Prophet wasallam. He didn't come out. And there were some people who were with him who wanted to go out and he would stop them from going out because it's not time again to had this type of confrontation. So that's something that has to be considered. It's a possibility. 
this fitna that we're dealing with right now. We were hoping. Why wouldn't Sheikh Salah Fozan just come out and say, everybody be quiet? I would think that would be very easy. That he said to everybody, every Sheikh involved, you be quiet and tell your students be quiet. Why, why, why wouldn't they do that? Because they love confusion. Maybe that practice is um, being done because it'll be a bigger fitna. Allah knows best. Secondly, if it is the reality that someone needs to be refuted, it is a reality that this young person who's not qualified is the only one. In this case, our religion is a balanced religion. When a person finds himself in a situation of necessity, then Al-Islam, it uh, loosens up the reins. So you can't do this, you can't do that, but due to necessity, the reins are loosened up. They're not as stringent, they're not as strong. So we feel a lot to, our, to the best of our ability. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Okay, inshallah. Naktafi bihad al-qadr. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.